Christian Helmig from the Vienna University of Technology in Austria, TU Wien. I have the pleasure to uh, be the chairman of the first session, as I just learned three minutes ago. Um, we have three uh, very interesting talks of three very esteemed colleagues, so therefore I think it's the best I speak the least and they speak the most. And in this uh, sense, I would directly like to introduce the first of them, Professor Sigmund, who will talk about topology optimization for coupled thermos fluidic problems, please. Thank you very much, uh, first to the organizers for inviting me to come here to this beautiful place uh, in Italy. So uh, actually there's no S in thermos. It has nothing to do with coffee in the morning, but it's just thermofluidic problems. But, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, recent developments in my group within uh, topology optimization of uh, thermofluidic problems. And specifically, we are working on a project we call the Top 10 Project, uh, which stands for topology optimization of thermal, uh, thermal energy systems. And so uh, I have three uh, applications in mind uh, here. And one would be passive cooling devices, where we want to uh, cool uh, electronic devices like LED lamps or CPU coolers by just passive convection. We could think of thermoelectric uh, generators where you use some special materials that can take waste uh, energy or waste heat energy from, for example, truck engines and convert it to electricity for the onboard electronic system. Or we could talk about uh, heat regenerators, which are some special kind of uh, heat exchangers. And so common for these three kinds of applications is partly that they consist of coupled problems, they are highly nonlinear, and last but not least, their geometry determines uh, the response of these structures. And if you can find the optimal uh, geometry or optimal topology of these devices, you may be able to enhance their functionality and efficiency very much. So the idea of the project is to use topology optimization to come up with the, uh, optimal structures for these devices. And so for those of you who uh, don't have a strong background in topology optimization, I will just demonstrate the uh, concept uh, with a simple example here. And so to the left, we have a design problem. We have uh, some load uh, and a torsional uh, moment that has to be transferred uh, to a wall. And uh, we have a design domain that uh, is made up of this cube, and we have some non-design non domains made of these cylinders uh, that have to be empty of material for uh, mounting purposes. And so a simple intuitive solution would just be to have a straight bar here, but certainly if we have this big design space, this will not be optimal. We can make much stiffer or much lighter structures than that. And so this is where the topology optimization concept comes into play. So essentially we divide the design domain into a large number of elements and we assign a density design variable to each of these elements. This density design variable can take any value between zero, denoting void, and one, denoting solid. And then uh, we use a gradient-based, so deterministic optimization method to redistribute material in these elements until uh, based on some objective function, in this case uh, weighted sum of compliances, and then after convergence, you come up with optimal structures. And so uh, you will see here, oh, sorry, I started it uh, here. So uh, this is an animation of the design process where each picture uh, shows one uh, design update. And you see it sort of tries around different configurations until it converges to a nice uh, bar-like structure, as you see here, which is certainly much stiffer uh, than the straight bar would have been. So uh, to get a bit more into the details about it, uh, we have the following optimization problem. So we have a design domain with a design variables uh, row, and they are collected in a density uh, design variable vector uh, row bar, or um, bold row, sorry. And so we are trying to find the optimal distribution of these densities such that we minimize some objective function, could be compliance or something more advanced. And this objective function could be a function of the densities, obviously, and the state variable u. Then we have a volume constraint, and we could have some other uh, structural or uh, geometrical constraints. And uh, of course, we have to satisfy the equilibrium given by this nonlinear residual formulation. And these design variables, as I said, can take values between 0 and 1. And now, since these design variables also can take intermediate values that would correspond to some kind of porous material, in some cases we can actually build these porous structures. If we don't want to do that, we would like to end up with discrete solutions, and we do that by selecting appropriate interpolation functions. So in the stiffness design, we select a power law approach where we have a P is a, an exponent larger than one, 
And by selecting this value appropriately, then we will penalize intermediate densities. And hence, even though we have a continuous optimization problem, we end up in discrete solutions, as we saw before. So this is a general optimization problem. The flow chart would look something like this. So we have an initialization, impose boundary conditions, do the finite element discretization. We solve the nonlinear finite element problem. And then we do the sensitivity analysis. And I will not go too much into details here, but just saying that we always use that so-called adjoint method for sensitivity analysis. And this means that the gradients with respect to all the design variables can be determined uh, by this expression, where lambda is an adjoint vector that you get from solving an extra so-called adjoint problem. And so in short, it means that the cost of doing the sensitivity analysis is never more exp uh, expensive than solving the original problem. And in most cases, it's much less expensive. So it means that even though we are uh, dealing with problems of up to, yeah, we are approaching one billion uh, design <coughs> variables, then the sensitivity analysis is extremely efficient, not much more expensive than the original analysis. And so we can still afford to, to do a design cycle where we maybe have to iterate for one, uh, 100 to 500 iterations. Okay, so based on the gradients, we use a math programming uh, method to come up with the uh, optimal design change, and then we iterate this until convergence. We also have a box here which is called regularization, so partly we ensure uh, mesh independency, but we also have a lot of tools in order to control length scale or make them, uh, the optimal designs insensitive to manufacturing errors and stuff like that. I don't have time to talk about that here, but I can say that there's a lot of work behind that. So this is essentially the code uh, or the uh, algorithm that we are working with. And so now we want to apply this to fluid problems and uh, we, as I said, we have quite a lot of activities going on in my group with regards to uh, fluid uh, optimization. And so I'll just give you a short overview of some of these uh, uh, code activities that we have. So essentially for developing the initial ideas, we use in-house MATLAB codes or use the commercial code uh, console to do our initial both modeling and uh, topology optimization studies. But then for our production runs, we have uh, been developing a large scale code based on the PETSI, so that's Portable Extensible Toolkit for Scientific Computations developed by Sandia Labs. Uh, and. Uh, no, Argon Labs, I guess. And uh, this essentially allows us to run these things in parallel on very big machines. So we have just uh, done runs up to 12,000 uh, processors, but we are approaching 30,000 and everything scales very well in this. And so this code is a steady state code uh, so far. It's based on a geomet uh, geometric uh, multigrid uh, preconditioning and uh, iterative solvers. And so far, the biggest disadvantage of this code is that we are limited to map meshes. We don't have a free mesh generator in this, uh, and that sort of limits some of our applications. But otherwise, this is an extremely nice framework we are developing. Uh, in parallel to that, we are also working on a PET, uh, PETSI uh, lattice Boltzmann method that allows us to run uh, transient uh, fluid problems. And so uh, these codes we combine with topology optimization and with these various uh, filtering and projection methods that I was talking about. So uh, let's look at the, the first application just to pure fluid problems. And so I will not go into details about the solving of these problems, but sort of just uh, give an overview of uh, how we uh, solve the problems uh, in topology optimization settings. So the color coding here, you recognize the Navier-Stokes, uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation here. The color coding here is that blue stands for the state variable and alpha is the design dependent variable. And so in this case, you can see here alpha, you could see it as an imperme impermeability factor or a, a, a dissipation factor. And so if alpha is zero, we have fluid. If alpha is infinite or has a very large number, we stop the flow. So essentially by uh, tuning the alpha parameters spatially, we can control where there is flow and where there is no flow. Uh, and this uh, factor, essentially our design variable is still a density design variable. So when rho is zero, alpha takes a big value and essentially we stop the flow. Uh, and in the fluid regions, uh, density is one, uh, giving alpha zero, and then we recover the Navier-Stokes equations. 
And uh, essentially, we have an interpolation scheme. And so the choice of this interpolation scheme is pretty important. And I could say we have a factor here corresponding to the penalization factor we saw for stiffness before. And uh, this uh, is uh, changed in an uh, iterative manner during the optimization process in order to reach uh, good designs. And so for the pure fluid problem, uh, it's quite trivial to find a good interpolation function. But when it comes to the coupled problems, it's uh, not that trivial anymore to find the right combination of interpolation functions. But I will come back to that later. So uh, with this formulation, people have done uh, several works on optimizing fluid problems. So starting uh, more than 10 years ago with Borwell and Peterson, who did the simple rugby ball uh, optimization problem two parallel fluid problems, if the distance is long enough, they will merge and go together before they split at the end. We extended it to uh, slightly higher Reynolds numbers, uh, and we could make a flow diode that would uh, expel the flow uh, at two different places, uh, depending on the Reynolds number. We have extended it to 3D, and actually now it also com uh, exists uh, commercially, so uh, 3DS or Abacus has a uh, uh, topology optimization fluid solver in their code also and allows them to, for example, optimize the inlet of a con catalytic uh, converter for cars. So, uh, but these are all steady state solutions. Uh, so, as I said, we have been developing this uh, Lattice Boltzmann method with transient, uh, for transient uh, fluid problems. And I will just give you one example of what can be solved with that. So, we are considering a 2D fluid pump. We have an incoming uh, pumping action here. So essentially, we are uh, oscillating the incoming flow here and uh, with a uh, parabolic flow profile. We have a reservoir here. And the optimization problem consists in distributing obstacles in this design domain such that we maximize the outflow uh, in this direction here. And uh, you will see here, this is the optimized design. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but it's actually quite intuitive. So you can see when the pumping action is here, the fluid flow will flow uh, this direction. When it reverses the pumping here, it, the fluid will come back, but it cannot find its way through this here. So it's a little bit like a Tesla valve, if somebody of you uh, know that for a nonlinear fluid uh, uh, valve structure. And uh, so essentially, the fluid that reverses will come back here and then go out again here. I would have liked to show a particle animation of how this looks like, but we were not able to finish that in time. But I have uh, an animation here of the fluid uh, direction, and the color shows uh, velocity or the fluid flow magnitude. And you can see once it has sort of re the transients have died out, you will see that there's almost a constant outflow at the outflow edge here, and also almost a constant inflow uh, also here. And you will see how the fluid uh, goes through here. So uh, this was our first example of a transient uh, topology optimization of fluid flow. And obviously, we can use that when we combine it with thermal problems also for these uh, thermal uh, regenerators and stuff like that. So we are approaching that. And we are also developing this uh, lattice Boltzmann code to the three dimensions. But uh, let me go to a more advanced problem. So, uh, so far, it was a pure fluid problem. Now we uh, extend it to a convection diffusion problem. And so essentially, we continue the color coding. So we added the convection diffusion uh, problem. And now we have the state variable that came from the Navier-Stokes equation enters into the convection diffusion equation. Uh, and you could see T here as either a temperature or as a concentration of species. And uh, K here is the diffusion uh, coefficient. And so if K is small, we have a pure convection dominated uh, problem. And if uh, K is larger, we get more and more diffusion domination. And so with this problem, we can start solving mixing problems or other stuff like that. And I will show you uh, three examples here. So the first one is that we have a channel flow here with two fluids coming in. And we want to uh, do the optimal mixing at the end. So that's objective function. This is easy if we allow a large pressure drop. Uh, but that would also cost energy to overcome this large pressure uh, drop. So we add a pressure drop constraint on it. And what comes out of it, uh, I will show the animation here. Uh, so you follow at the upper picture here, uh, you see the mixing of the two fluids. It doesn't come out ideally mixed at the end, but uh, I think pretty well, well. So if we had a larger pressure uh, drop, then we could have uh, the ideal <coughs> mixing. 
Then we can take this problem further and say, could we make a, a fluid uh, crossing? So essentially, we have the two parallel fluids uh, coming in, and we want to have them come out in a checkerboard fashion like that. And so again, it's a, a matter of minimizing the error in obtaining the uh, wanted pattern at the end with a, a pressure drop uh, constraint. And we see now here the structure looks like this. And this time we had a manufacturing constraint, so the material can only enter from top or bottom. So it means you can make two parts of structure in 3D printing, put them on top of each other, and you have this uh, mixing device. And you see, I think it ends up pretty well in actually having this mixing behavior that we prescribed. And so I teased my coworkers and said, well, maybe we can get to a full checkerboard uh, if we continue. And so you will see here, here we prescribed four by four and it actually comes out pretty well at the other end, uh, all by uh, this topology optimization approach. So this was uh, pure mixing problems. Then uh, we go to the final uh, level here, which is to design passive cooling devices. And this particular project is also in a uh, collaboration with a small Danish uh, company, startup company, that specializes in providing uh, cooling solutions for LED lamps. So even though LED lamps are very efficient, they still provide a lot of heat and they need to be cooled in order to work uh, and have a long life. And so uh, this idea of the industrial designer there is to put uh, some kind of porous structure here that will uh, cause natural convection through it and thereby cooling. And this guy has a very nice uh, intuition and has built all kinds of structures that he has come up with by intuition. And he builds them with additive manufacturing in aluminum. So there are some structures here. There's also the structure that he calls the tulip structure. And uh, so whereas he may have a very good intuition, I still believe that if we find the optimal structure, we can do it much more efficiently. We can save material, make more com compact devices, and even get better cooling. But of course, that takes quite a while to build codes and optimization. So uh, uh, we are still working on it, but I'm showing you some of the early designs of that. So now uh, the equations uh, get somewhat more complicated. We still have the convection diffusion equation, but now we also have a uh, source term here. So some of the structure will generate heat. That's uh, the LED lamp. And of course, this depends also on the spatial variable. So it's red here. And so we have now three interpolation functions to take care of, which makes life somewhat complicated. And then we also have that the problem is now fully coupled because the temperature enters back into the fluid equations uh, and gives this buoyancy term that will call, uh, cause the convective uh, flow here. And hence, we have both the, uh, the Prandtl number and the Grashof number, and we have uh, the gravity vector here, and the temperature couples back. So uh, the problem is more advanced, uh, more difficult to solve, but still manageable by the topology optimization. Uh, and uh, of course, to really work in practice, we also have to calibrate it. So we are working with experimentalists who do partly infrared imaging of the structures to calibrate our results. And partly they have a, a laser Doppler and anemometry uh, set up such that we can calculate the fluid flow above uh, these cooling devices and thereby calibrate the numerical models. And so we have pictures like this is a plot of the fluid velocity above one of these devices. And we have these thermal imaging devices that we calibrate our stuff with. So we are still in the process of getting the accurate, uh, accurate uh, um, correspondence here. But meanwhile, we are testing uh, the topology optimization on still, I would say, rather academic problems. So first, just a 2D design of a natural convection cooler. So this is a closed cavity cooler. And you can imagine you have a hot source here. That could be an LED lamp that needs to be cooled. We have uh, cold boundaries here. And we have a fluid around it. And inside the design domain, we can distribute either conducting material or fluids in order to get the best cooling or essentially minimize the temperature at the inlet here. And so uh, depending on the Grashof number, we get uh, different optimized designs. And the, the Grashof number uh, uh, says something between the re relations between diffusion and buoyancy. And so the higher the Grashof number, the more the buoyancy term plays a role and in other words, saying that we get more and more convection-dominated flow uh, once the Grashof number goes up. 
And so you will see for a small grass of number, we have uh, a structure that looks like that. So red is a uh, conducting structure, blue is uh, fluid. And remember the walls are cold out here. So what it tries is to uh, conduct the heat as fast as possible toward as close to as possible to the walls. Uh, and then by diffusion, it will just uh, go out the walls, the heat. Whereas when we increase the Grashof number, we get a more smooth structure that enhances the convection. And you can see here that the fluid will uh, rotate in these eddies here, getting heated here, accelerated, and rotating up to the top and the uh, sides where it's cooled. And in that way, it will uh, have a very efficient uh, energy transfer process. And so the pictures to the right, those are the temperature plots. Uh, with plotted in the same scale, and so it's obvious that it, when you have more buoyancy, you get a much more efficient cooling because you can have the convection carry uh, the heat and not just by diffusion. Here. So this was a 2D. Uh, we can do it in 3D also now. Uh, so we just look at a quarter of the design domain. Uh, we have something like, I believe, uh, 6 million design variables. Uh, 30 million uh, degrees of freedom in the whole problem, it runs on 1,000 processes overnight. And uh, the designs we see here uh, look like this. And so again, for the small Grashof number, we have a structure that tries to conduct the heat as close to the outer uh, boundaries as, uh, as fast as possible. But when we, the Grashof number increases, we get a more compact structure that transfers the heat efficiently to the fluid and doesn't provide too much fluid resistance. And in that way, uh, generates uh, this uh, rotating flow here. We are not, uh, still not at the final sort of interpretation of results. Uh, this was done with a volume constraint on the material. If we let the volume uh, free, we might get other conclusions. But I think uh, already it shows that topology optimization is trying to tell us something about the optimized uh, structures here. And uh, also this shows the velocity plots. Uh, they actually look fairly similar, but I can say that the, uh, the velocity is uh, two orders of magnitude higher for the higher class of numbers, obviously. So if some of you are interested in this and want to hear more details about the coding and the scheme here, then my uh, PhD student, Joe Alexanderson, will give a presentation on that uh, tomorrow afternoon uh, in session A07. Um, yep, and so this was all for a closed cavity. Now the real uh, LED lamp will be in an open uh, space, and hence uh, we cannot have the closed uh, walls. And that, of course, gives us some numerical uh, challenges because now suddenly our modeling space is much, much bigger. And so, uh, and our code is so far only suitable for map mesh, meaning that we have to use a lot of elements on essentially modeling something that is not very important for the problem. So we are fighting that a little bit uh, these days, but we have the first designs for, for cooling devices sitting in a free uh, flow with no boundary conditions, and uh, we see the first results here. So uh, how am, am I doing for time? Okay, perfect. So then uh, I... Uh, just one example before I continue to a totally different topic. So this is a forced convection cooler where we would like, uh, instead of just having natural convection, now we're looking at forced convection. So we have a heat plate and we want to m put some cylinders uh, or structures up that cools uh, uh, this, this hot plate as efficiently as possible. And so far, this was just done in a two dimensions, so the problem essentially looks like that. Distribute conducting material that transfers the heat of the bottom plate to the fluid uh, in the most efficient way. And so in uh, this case, uh, we have a prescribed pressure drop, and we try to minimize the average plate, and plate temperature. And so uh, this here come, uh, is the design. This was produced with a COMSOL uh, uh, modeling system. And we see it's actually funny, it has these funny small bumps here, and it wants these bumps. We tried to remove them, but they come back during the optimization. So we haven't really figured out what it is trying to tell us, but I'm sure that there's a story when we dig deeper into it. So this is the design with the conductors that conduct the heat to the fluid. This is the fluid temperature, and we see that it almost uh, has uniform temperature, indicating that we indeed have an optimal structure. And we see here the, the velocity magnitude. And so obviously you can try with different pressure drops. So this was the design for pressure drop one, still an academic value. 
If we allow uh, less pressure drop, then it can put less obstacles in there, and of course it will be less efficient. If we allow more pressure drop, uh, the obstacles can be bigger and thereby carry more heat uh, to the flow. Yeah. So there are certainly lessons to be learned when studying these optimized structures. And interestingly, they are not just aerodynamic shapes, but somehow they are trying to, to uh, convey the heat to the fluid as efficiently as possible. Uh, so we just looked at the quantitative results, and so obviously uh, we get higher Reynolds numbers with increasing uh, pressure drop, and we get a less plate temperature. But the important part here was that each of these points uh, represent optimized designs, and hence we see that it's fairly consistent. Maybe just this structure was a local optimum, and so we have to redo uh, this example and see. So this would sort of be the upper bound on the possible Reynolds numbers for the prescribed pressure drops. Okay, so this was uh, all the f uh, fluid uh, problems. Let me just spend three minutes, four minutes, on a structural fire safety problem. And here I already have to excuse myself for Bernard Schreffler as a big uh, fire expert. We are starting extremely simply here, but I hope you can see what we are aiming at. So probably in a couple of years we will be able to do fairly uh, sophisticated things. So the general idea is uh, that buildings have to be protected uh, for cyber, fire safety. And what's often happening these days is that first the structural engineers and the architects design the building, and then afterwards the fire safety experts come, and they add extra fire protective material to it, or they encapsulate some of the uh, sensitive parts of the structure such that it's um, less sensitive to fire. And maybe in that process, the building gets much more expensive, more, more heavy, or it doesn't look as good as it was supposed to. So our idea was to say, maybe we can uh, do the optimization of the structure and the fire safety at the same time. And so as I said, we are looking so far at an extremely simplified model. So if you look at uh, the building of a fire, uh, you have an incipient stage, a growing stage, and then at some point you get so-called flashover, where the whole room is engulfed in fire and hot gases, and this is called the burning stage. And so our simplified model will just assume that we have reached this burning stage where our structure that we are optimizing is totally engulfed in fire, and so essentially you can just model it, uh, the boundary condition as a, a convection uh, a boundary condition. The other extreme simplification we are doing is uh, that we have a material law looking like this, so initially, when there's no fire, we have a certain stiffness of our material, but then when the, re the temperature reaches a certain stage, then there's a sudden drop in the stiffness, indicating you could see it as wood. When it has reached a certain temperature, uh, it's only char, and it has no stiffness anymore. So that's also a very simplified model. And so uh, in, you could see the popularized uh, version of it. We have a structure engulfed in hot uh, fumes, Initially, it has its full stiffness, but after a certain time, so we do a, a time history of this uh, structural degradation, then parts of it will be burned away, indicated in gray uh, color here, and hence you will have much bigger displacements. And so uh, the optimization problem is to minimize the compliance uh, and the an undamaged structure, and then saying after a certain time, uh, the structural degradation can only reach a certain level. So, for example, we will still uh, want to have 20% of the initial stiffness after a certain uh, time period. And so this gives us a nonlinear thermal problem that we couple uh, weakly to the structural problem, and uh, otherwise the process is as before. And so let me just show you a couple of small problems so of these very initial studies. And so this is the so-called MBB beam uh, optimization problem. So uh, this is a, a simply supported beam with a load in the middle. We are just looking at the left half of it. And we see that if we don't uh, require any structural fire safety, then we get this fairly well-known Michel-like structure with small details. But as we increase the requirement to the uh, structural fire uh, 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 resistance, then we get less and less of these small bars, and at the end we have a structure that only has thick bars, meaning that it will take much longer to burn uh, if it's in, or to degrade if it's in a fire. And so one can look at the time history of this. Uh, I'll not go into details there, but I can show you an animation here. So the top structure is the one optimized not for fire safety, and the lower one is optimized for fire safety. And you will see the gray color indicates the degradation of the material. And so you will see here that the top structure loses its stiffness very rapidly and, of course, destroys, 
whereas the lower structure, the, uh, the fire uh, slowly eats the structure and uh, it stays uh, stable all the way here. So uh, very preliminary results, uh, don't tease me too much about it, but of course at some point we want to combine this with the convection and fluid modeling there and maybe together with Freffler or others actually do the real modeling of these structures. And so of course you can also destroy the beautiful Michel structure that many of you uh, uh, know. So if we have require it to be safe with respect to fire, we get this kind of boring structure uh, down here. And as a final example, uh, just a bridge example to show that uh, here we optimized uh, a structure just for a distributed load here. Then uh, if we subject it to fire in the lower quarter of the design domain here, then after a certain time it will be degraded, now indicated in red, and of course the bridge will fall down. But so if we require it still after this fire to have 20% of its initial stiffness, then we get a structure looking like that, and we see now it's sort of redundant. Uh, it puts some extra part of the structure up here where there's no fire, and hence even after the fire, even though this here has uh, degraded due to the fire, we have a, a redundant path, a uh, load-carrying path here. So I think it indicates that there's some potential here, but as I said, it's extremely simple. So uh, just to conclude here, I have presented several uh, interesting challenges regarding topology optimization in fluids and thermofluidics and uh, very briefly on the structural fire safety issue. Uh, certainly this fire safety is at a very initial state, but I hope we will become more realistic in the future. Uh, many of these designs, I believe, can be directly transferred, certainly to additive manufacturing uh, processes, and this is something we are working in close collaboration with these people about. Uh, and finally, as I said on the way, these interpolation schemes that we use to interpolate for intermediate densities are quite difficult the more physics we put into it. So we are actually also investigating ways of actually moving the boundary to have uh, the correct modeling of the boundary conditions. So with this, uh, I will end my talk with some uh, references to papers for those interested. So thank you very much for your attention.